I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Conversations with Al McFarland. Today's live broadcast from the Minneapolis Urban League in North Minneapolis. We thank you for listening on KFAI and those who'll be watching the show. We're taping it for presentation on public access television here in Twin Cities. Thanks for being here and thanks for listening. This is a continuation of a series of public policy forums that we call Robust Conversations, talking about important issues of the day. Today's issue is education, and we start with the idea of there being a paradox facing inner city schools in general, schools in North Minneapolis in particular. I had a conversation recently with Jeff Hassan. He's the former education chair of the African American Leadership Forum. This uh, task force studied the experience of black families in North Minneapolis and in inner city schools and found that more often than not, students and families reported that they were satisfied, happy, pleased with the schools they attended and the teachers that taught their children. At the same time, studies indicate those same schools have an experience rate of 70, 80 percent below grade experience for the students. That is a paradox. How is it that on the one hand, our children, our families say they love the schools they're in and they love the teachers that are teaching them, and at the same time, they are failing, falling behind. We want to raise that question and we ask Jeff Hassan to come to present that. Also on today's program, responding to and providing solutions, both from a practical experience and from the legislative policy area, we have Sandra Samuels, she's CEO of the Northside Achievement Zone. She'll talk about that set of answers and that plan to attack, destroy, eliminate the achievement gap that has characterized education experience for our people. There's a legislative role here as well, and we've invited State Representative Rena Moran to talk about what's happening in today's legislature, one that's calling itself an education legislature. We'll see what that means. First of all, uh, Jeff Hassan, good morning. Good morning. Give me the, the background. Set this up, because this was an intriguing analysis that you presented, and I'll say to our viewers and listeners that they'll be able to see slides depicting some of the things you're talking about later on. Okay, great. Uh, just for the, uh, uh, the broadcast audience, by way of background, uh, I'm an attorney by profession, and I happen to represent Minneapolis Public Schools as one of their outside legal counsel, and I also uh, represent a number of charter schools, namely Harvest Prep Academy, Best Academy, and a new uh, Mastery School, which is actually a collaboration between Minneapolis Public Schools and the leaders of Harvest Prep and Best Academy. Uh, three or four years ago, uh, a group of African American leaders came together to form uh, what's now known as the African American Leadership Forum. Uh, that forum broke out into different work groups, uh, including education, health, uh, employment, economic development. And uh, the, the group that I gravitated towards, and in fact, uh, the largest uh, uh, percentage of participants gravitated towards was education, because all of us sitting at the table understood that uh, the primary reason we were sitting at the table is because we had enjoyed the benefits of an education that had uh, fostered and, and moved us forward in our careers. And the education work group said its simple goal, and, and I'm saying that somewhat uh, facetiously, but our goal is simply to close the achievement gap for African American children in Minneapolis and St. Paul by the year 2020. And so we first set about uh, researching to find out what the, uh, what the facts and circumstances are. And so <clears throat> uh, over the period of about three or four years, um, uh, and this led up to my conversation with you, Al, is that we uh, saw that there, 
there's this big uh, disconnect, which we're now calling a paradox, in which the schools serving African-American children, and if we focus on North Minneapolis, for example, because that's where we have the largest concentration of African-American children in Minneapolis and St. Paul, those schools serving our children are the schools that are failing the most. Uh, so that at those schools, we have uh, proficiency levels at a top, at a high of 40% in reading and at a low of 10% in math, whereas the statewide average is close to 70% in reading. Actually, it's higher than that. It's 77% uh, in reading, and in math, it's about 56%. Uh, <clears throat> and along with that, now, that would be a big problem, except that we do have an example of some very high-performing schools serving that same cohort of of African American students in Harvest Prep, Best Academy, which are performing above the statewide average and are performing at 80% in reading and an astounding 82% in math. African American students, 99.9% .9 at Harvest Prep and Best Academy, are exceeding the statewide average in math by 16 percentage points, which actually computes to a variance of about 35 percent, okay? Same students that are being served in uh, the public schools that same, are- Same that, families. That are same, same families, and if you knew the particulars, you would know that they're the same families because they bring the same issues, but <clears throat> you can go right across the street, and one school is producing results of 10 percent proficiency, and Harvest and Best are producing 80% proficiency. Now, one thing they do have in common is all the parents are happy with both of the schools. Uh, we're concerned that our parents are happy with schools that are putting out 10% proficiency, which means that 90% uh, or <clears throat> 70 to 90% of the kids are failing. That's just unacceptable. We're fortunate to have school leadership in Minneapolis Public Schools and the superintendent, Bernadia Johnson, who is just as concerned about this problem as working with us to, to try to address and resolve it. Thank you, Jeff. Let me go to Lorena Moran. Representative Moran, thank you for being here. This legislature is uh, tackling the financial uh, questions, the lack of funding for education, and has decided that uh, its priority is to robustly uh, support education. Where do we stand right now with education funding for the state of Minnesota? Yeah, well, good morning, Al. I am really, really excited to be here and even more excited about the, the funds and the, and that we are giving to our educational system. It, I mean, it's, it's really a huge investment. I can say clearly for once we are putting our money where our mouth is. We know the importance of investing in our kids and investing early. So we have invested from pre K mm -hmm. to post secondary we have aligned the funding accordingly. So we're putting over 50 million in pre-K education. We are going to fund um, four day uh, kindergarten. And what is really important about that is that, you know, there's extremely a, a, a numerous amount of research. This talks about um, uh, ACEs, this talks about brain development. Then we know 90% of a child's brain has developed by the age of five. And if we know that, it is key that we begin to invest early and have kids in quality daycare centers um, so that they can enter kindergarten read and prepared, reading by third grade, because there's indicators that say if our kids are reading by third grade, they're more apt to be successful in school and in life. So I'm really excited that we are investing early with that. We have also increased funding for K-12 schools by $315 million a really huge investment, and also uh, increasing funding to higher ed, to the University of Minnesota, Minsky, by $150 million. Really huge investment. But not only is the funding there, is that we have also created some really good policies. Policies that I believe, and many of us believe, all the educational professionals believe that we are now in a position around assessment where we are going to be aligning kids' aspirations with the courses that, need, that, need, that they need to take. So what I mean by that is that we are getting rid of the grad testing. 
the grad testing test that was aligned to nothing. It had no purpose uh, except for, in my mind, in many other minds, to create the disparities that we have right now, to create failure that was really very punitive. So we're gonna remove and take that away and some of the scores that we can look at um, the grad test and the results that that was producing for American Indians, they were um, passing the grad test at 58%, for Asian Pacific Islanders at 64%, blacks at 50%, Hispanics at 54%, and whites at 84%. That is an injustice. Mm -hmm. Anytime that we can celebrate, celebrate about the, the fantastic schools we have here, we are celebrating the stats of white students. I cannot celebrate the success of white students when we are leaving behind so many of our kids of color, particularly our black kids. But does just changing the test solve the problem? So that is a tool mm -hmm. of many tools that need to be in place along with pre-K, along with full-day kindergarten, along with aligning the aspirations of our kids. So the assessments is really is about this. There will be testing, mm -hmm. but the testing will be done to figure out if you, if there's a student who decides to go to college, there's a course and a path for that student. If, that's, if another student decides, well, I only want to do maybe a technical school, a two-year program, we're going to align their goals and aspirations in that in, uh, accordingly. And there may, maybe another student decides, well, you know what, I, I'm, I don't want to go to college. I want to be prepared into, to go into a workforce. Mm -hmm. So how do we align bringing in the parent with that student around their goals, their aspirations, what they want to do for life, mm -hmm. and support them through that way and through the whole testing process? And I think this is more in line with creating success for all our kids, um, creating a path for all of our kids, and recognizing there are different avenues for each and every child, but not to leave anyone behind. The grad testing, you know, which we have been saying, I have heard so often that we're, the Democrats are dumbing it down and um, they don't want to value the diploma anymore. All of that's really is false. You know, it's, this been, has been over a five-year process where many of the educators, from superintendents to the, the, um, the education board of education, mm -hmm. teachers, mm -hmm. All of them are recommending this path. That's this path that they have been working on for the last five years to say this will create better outcomes. It, it, is it, is pre-K the solution? Is kindergarten the solution? Is this assessment process the solution? There are all tools to get us in a better path so that we are ensuring the success of every child in the state of Minnesota regardless because poverty in my mind is not an indicator of failure. It is not. Great, thank you, Representative Moran. Project that's geographic specific yeah. uh, has hard goals, uh, engagement uh, strategies. Uh, it's called the North Side Achievement Zone. Talk about that, and in the process, uh, put in context the dilemma that Jeff Hassan talked about, and the state's willingness now, more than before, to invest in education and to change the measures of outcomes. What do you think? Yeah, th thank you. You're gonna have to cut me off, Al. I, ha I have a lot of thoughts about all of that. So, so we've uh, you, you've done it before. So be f free to do it again. Um, and thank you for having me on the thank show. You, for being here. Um, you know, I want to start out by saying um, that you know what I truly believe and what we're seeing around the country is that the success of all of our children, particularly African American children, but all children, rests on a four-legged stool. Um, and it depends on parents and the strength of the parents and the family. Uh, it depends on community, the strength of the community and how cohesive we are. Uh, it depends on schools, 
you know, and teachers and unions and districts, you know, uh, and, the, and the policies that come out of there and the practices. And then it also depends on our uh, political structure and our policies that are at a state level, you know, as well. And if one of those stools is broken, uh, one of those legs, um, a child can still be successful. If, if two are broken, you know, they, they might be I, as, as we would say in, in my neighborhood. And, uh, but when three and four are broken, um, that child is totally imperiled and, and needs a lifeline like right away. And what we're finding in the heart of North Minneapolis is that for many of our children, uh, uh, one leg is broken or maybe all four you know, uh, of the stool, uh, two, two, or, two or more. And so, um, you know, as we have this dialogue, um, what, what's become really clear to me is not doing the blame game, but everybody accepting responsibility for their lane, for what they're responsible for. And, um, you know, what, what we're seeing is that politically, what's happening at the Capitol is not enough to move our children forward. Hasn't been, you know, we've been, the, we've been talking about the achievement gap for 40 years in Minnesota, right? 20 years ago, started getting a little bit serious, and yet today, we have the second lowest four-year graduation rate in the state for African-American uh, students yeah. across the country, excuse me, right? Low, second, the only other state that's lower, and by the way, not Mississippi, not Illinois with the south side of Chicago, what people like to talk about, you know, all these folks coming here from the south side, um, not Alabama, but Nevada, the only other state that did worse. And then uh, uh, for Latino and American Indians, we are dead last, and this is nationwide, using the same measurement, who entered um, ninth grade and then graduated four years later. So anyway, so there's a lot of things that the state needs to do that they haven't been doing, right? And then there's a lot of things that parents need to be doing. We can't, for me, I want to like just talk to my black brothers and sisters and say we got to step up, right? And I don't care. People can say, oh, you blame the victim. No. There are ways that we as a community have always supported each other. For those of us who have and those of us who, who, who don't, and, and, and really coming together to form that bedrock of support. And that's what we need to do right now because parents are the first teachers. So they're not off the hook. Um, but then there's the schools. And as soon as you start talking about schools and teachers' unions and saying that they can do anything differently, then you're bashing unions, right? And there's so many things that they should do differently and so many progressive things that unions have blocked. And yes, I've said the name that shouldn't be named, and that's union. You know, I mean, we all, we all here talk about this stuff in, in parking lots, right? And when we get in meetings, we're scared to say it because of partisan politics. Um, and then in terms of community, so I want to, so I want to, that's where the North Side Achievement Zone comes in. Um, you know, uh, when, pre when then Senator Obama was running for president, he heard about the Harlem Children's Zone, um, which is uh, the, the, what we are replicating across the country. There are now 61 promised neighborhoods. He said, if I become president, I want to see the same outcomes that are happening in central Harlem. I want to see the same comprehensive community development that's taking place because they are serious about educating all their children who are largely well, just about all African and African American. And he said, if I become president, I'm gonna replicate. As soon as he became president, he uh, um, you know, partnered up with Jeff Canada, Angela Glover Blackwell from Policy Lincoln and Jeff Harlem Children's Zone. And now we have 61 promised neighborhoods. We are one. Um, a promised neighborhood is simply um, that uh, the adults in the community uh, get serious. And, and we say that we are going to play nice in the sandbox for once. And, uh, and that, w that our kids will be promised great schools at the center surrounded by strong family and community support. And to do that, we received um, in 2011 um, a $28 million grant over a, a five-year period um, to really build this machine of support for community. And the first thing that we do is work with parents. I mean, that's the first. So this is not about, you know, again, I think we should be able to talk about schools and talk about politicians and talk about community and parents, but share the love and share the responsibility. And so for us, it's family engagement, it's the education pipeline, and it's whole family support. Family engagement, we, are, we, have, found, we have about 260 families in our pipeline right now, and, and they are our, my inspiration. Most are extremely low income. Um, they are resource poor. They are not uh, uh, integrity poor, resiliency poor. They are resource poor. And, and they want some support 
to be able to successfully navigate. I mean, I'm middle class. I have a master's degree. My husband ha has a master's degree. And we still sometimes scratch our head about how to really educate our kids. So they want a partner. And that's what we said. We know we're going to partner. And every door that we knocked on when we originally went through the zone in North Minneapolis, which is from West Broadway to um, uh, 35th and Penn to the highway, 255 blocks, every door we went to, when our NAS connectors, this is part of our family um, uh, engagement, is that we have people from the community who are doing the outreach, the in-reach, the door knocking, and partnering with the families. So all of our NAS connectors are from North Minneapolis, been there, done that right, and so know where the families are coming from. And, um, and when they door knocked and they asked the families, would you like your child to go to college? Because here's the thing, and that's the only thing around um, uh, what, you know, Representative Moran, you know, no offense at all. But, um, you know, as we start saying we're gonna match to the aspirations of children, children's aspirations are based on what the adults aspired for them. And so often, by the time they get to middle school and high school, they no longer, well, maybe they never even had the aspiration, but they know they're not on track because schools have been failing them, as well as their parents, by the way, as well as their community. So then they're not thinking about a four-year college. That seems like a whole distant thing. I think our, our policies, um, our parents, our schools, it has to be about high expectations with high support. We expect you as a community, and that's the history of the black community that I know about. You know, we expect you to graduate from a four-year college and go on and be successful and give back to your community, and we're gonna give you the supports for that to happen. And if they choose then, with those high expectations, holding up, giving the supports, laying the pathway, partnering with families, not to go on to college, boy, you know, we've all won, right? Because then they have options and opportunities because they, they still have had a solid education. So anyway, family engagement, the education pipeline, we're working in early childhood, and Representative Moran, I wanna thank you um, for all of the funding that's come to early childhood. That is so critical. We gotta start early and stay late. Kids mm -hmm. start kindergarten behind. They start behind, and they ne that's before they've ever laid eyes on a teacher, right? And they never catch up. Let me jump in here. You know, yeah. Jeffrey Hassan, we talked about this idea of creating a public mind. And so, uh, Sandra, you mentioned expectations. And expectations have to do with what you described, uh, Representative Moran, attuning the pathway to fulfill, to both create, acknowledge, and fulfill the expectations of individuals and families and therefore community and society. And so right now, I would say the situation is that in our community, there are low expectations or no expectations. And we have been acculturated into accepting that this is the way things are, that failure is okay, lack of achievement is okay, uh, and our kids internalize that and they reject their intelligence and they work hard they work hard proving that they are dumb. And they put a lot of intelligence into proving what they don't know. And so it's all twisted. It's upside down. <clears throat> so it seems to me, Jefferson, that one of the challenges, challenges is that we've got to change the mind of the community. That means, Sandra, changing individuals' minds, number one, but as we succeed in doing that, we create what I call a public mind. And the public mind is this massive, overarching expectation, a description of ourselves, a definition of ourselves as a culture. And this culture produces the expectation that everybody must go to college, must succeed, must work, must be productive, must be successful in all the ways we define success. Jeff, how is it happening so far at Harvest Prep, where you have guided and watched, and you're working with Eric McMood and Ella McMood to document their path of creating a different mindset. And hopefully that's gonna be one of the models that will be exported and expanded by NAS. Right, right. Uh, before I forget, and I wanna attribute this uh, to Sandra because she's the one that first brought it to, uh, to my attention. For this idea of creating a mindset, one of the simple things that parents can ask their teachers is, is my child at grade level? Doesn't matter if to first grade, second grade, whatever. That's something that everybody can remember. It's an easy phrase, easy idea. Is my child at grade level? 
you love your teacher, you love your school, all that's well and good, but is my child at grade level? And that's part of this public mind. It may, and that may end up being the, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the public mind uh, motto that uh, we carry forward. But <clears throat> in, terms of, uh, in terms of Harvest Prep and Best Academy, uh, whose schools that I serve as, uh, uh, as legal counsel to, um, just three or four years ago, uh, those schools were not achieving at the same level they are now. Uh, <clears throat> they were at about 50 or 60 percent uh, proficiency, which, by the way, was still twice as good as any other public school district. However, uh, Eric Mahmoud and his wife, Ella Mahmoud, uh, were not satisfied that they, with that. They didn't want to be the best of the worst. They wanted to be the best of the best. And so Eric, uh, being an engineer by background and training, went about solving the problem the same way that he would have solved the problem as, a, as an engineer. He went to all the highest performing schools around the country and sat at their uh, feet and learned from them. And within the space of three years, those schools went from 50% to 60% to 80% proficiency. Now, in response to <clears throat> the question of, well, is it necessary for everybody to go to college? Well, uh, the facts and research tell us that within the space of two years, 70% of the jobs in this country are gonna require at least two years of college or more. So you can say, well, you know, not everyone has the aspiration of going to college, and that, that's true. But that 30% uh, that it does not have post-secondary training, the kind of jobs that they're going to be able to get are customer service jobs that don't pay salaries that are sufficient to support them and their family. Now, there are some technical trade jobs, but if you listen to NPR, you can hear that they're having the same problems in the technical trade field. They're not turning out the kind of students, and this is rural Minnesota. They're not turning out the kind of students that, that have the uh, proficiency to even learn technical trades. And so uh, Eric Mahmoud, Ella Mahmoud at their schools uh, accept no excuses. The standard is college and, and beyond, okay? And so they're turning out students uh, who are 80% proficient in math and reading and uh, 90 plus percent who are going on to college and post-secondary options. And so uh, that's the world we live in. Now, when I was a kid, only 40% of the jobs required a college education. And so, you know, you could, you could deal with 40% proficiency, but that's not the world we're living in today. And so, and so that's why we have to prepare our kids. You mentioned uh, when you were a kid, and I, I flashed back to growing up in Kansas City, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there were two tracks at least, one for regular academics in which people would graduate and go either into the workforce or to college. And there was a certain school that you sent, you were sent to that was a manual arts mm -hmm. school. And vocational. so, yeah. vocational school. Mm -hmm. And the perception there was that if you were not smart, you were tracked to vocational school. And in vocational school, you learned to do laundry, uh, press clothes, you know, do work that you can also learn if you're in prison. Right, and so that was your your work future. And counselors would tell uh, black students, "You don't really have a future in high school or in college, and why don't you go down to manual school or to vocational school?" Then there was a period where the vocations took on a different uh, value, and we who rejected vocational training were discovering that the vocational training was providing real uh, beneficial work opportunity for people. So we got caught in between uh, values there. So where are we now? And it seems that you're saying, Sandra, that we need to create a process that educates to the highest and allows people to do what they choose to do anywhere on the spectrum of employment and of fulfillment. But not because they don't think <coughs> they mm. could make it in college. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I mean, so Jeff, something that Jeff and Eric 
uh, through the African American Leadership Forum that I'm a part of too, talk about strongly is that the achievement gap is made up of a number of gaps. The, mm -hmm. the preparation gap, which, the, which Representative Moran talked about so eloquently, uh, the time gap, we need more time on task, longer school days, longer school years. Haven't been able to get that from the state, nor on a local level, um, for a lot of mitigating forces. Um, and, and so, and, and the leadership gap, teaching gap, you know, so on. But the, the most important thing, in my mind, is the belief gap. And that's, that's really what you're getting at, Alan. And you said it just perfectly. And I, and I love that public mind. You're going to hear me copying you like crazy. But, but it is. It's about do we really believe mm -hmm. that kids from 55411 and 12 can actually make it in college? And I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I have, I, I've been, I mean, be successful, not just be, and I love two-year schools. I went to a two-year school. That was my path. I went to a two-year school. Then I matriculated to a, a historically black college and university, then went on to my MBA. So love them, right? But when we start deciding in middle school that a kid is going to be tracked to a two-year school, that's, that's just crazy. I was at an a, a Achievement Gap meeting once, and there was a Minneapolis public school teacher. And I love public school teachers, right? I'm working with some incredible schools. We work with nine schools, and they are wonderful. The school leaders, and they are working hard. Um, but there are things that we need to do to change the system. And, I, and the teacher said, you know what, she just got flat, flabbergasted. And she said, this is the bottom line. You give me a kid born and bred in North Min I'm sorry, in Minneapolis, and I can educate them. She said, but you give me them kids from Southside Chicago and from Indiana that move around all the time, and I can, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I was so upset that day because it was like, you know, the kids who go into her classroom are damned before they sit down if they have even an ounce of melanin in their skin. You know, and it is, and so because what we know, we know this as a people, when we believe something, it becomes so. I mean, that's just the bottom line. You don't have to run around saying, what do you believe? What do you believe? Sandra, you just can look. I, can I interrupt you a Yeah, second? go ahead. Yeah, because you're on a roll. I know, I know. <laughs> but but, but it's, it, it, it's to the point you're making. Um, <clears throat> Just last week, I participated in Minneapolis Public Schools Principal Partner Day. And one of the most disturbing things to me uh, throughout that was this constant reference to kids being in poverty. Poverty, poverty, poverty. And that becomes the mindset. And what that means to those who are saying it and those who are listening is that it's OK if we don't educate these kids because they're in poverty. Now, no one's, yeah, no one's gonna come out and say that. Right. Well, hell, probably everybody sitting at this table grew up in relative poverty. I know I didn't have any money growing up, but that didn't have a damn thing to do with how, how I was educated or my ability to be educated. And so when we got through with that thing, I stood up, I said, you know, we need to get this poverty and low income language out of our lexicon because the, the, the fact of the matter is 70% of the kids uh, in Minneapolis meet that demographic. And so what's unusual about that? That is the norm. And so Sandra, you attacked that by something simple, plain, clear. You addressed five-year-olds and three-year-olds and four-year-olds as scholars. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So you changed the, the naming and the naming is what's important, Jeff Hassan, right? Name this problem and this opportunity. Name it not as a problem, but as an opportunity, right. and go to work. So, so what's the thought behind that? By the way, we, we start in the womb, OK? Mm -hmm. We start in the womb. So mm -hmm. you know, I, when I talk to some young moms who are pregnant, which I get not ex excited because they're pregnant, but excited because I'm talking to them, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, that mm -hmm. we're in a relationship, and I say, do you want that scholar in your belly to go to college? Mm -hmm. You know, every one of them say, they say yes. Mm -hmm. And when you say, could you use some support with housing? So, you know, so here's the thing. There, there's this deal, the two mindsets. Um, you can only fix education when you fix poverty. That's what Jeff is talking about. So we just, as a society, have said there are some uneducable kids because they move too much, they're poor, their dad's incarcerated, or whatever. So there are excuses. The models of schools that, that Jeff is talking about, like, um, like Harvest Prep and the schools that Eric visited and Hiawatha Cap Academy here, is that there are no excuses. So you look poverty right in the face, and you say, yes, that's real, and it is harder. 
And you do have to do more. That's what we're trying to do in the zone is the purpose of the Northside Achievement Zone is to end multi-generational poverty using education as a lever. And so, so it is about housing, and it is about career financial pathways, and it is about you know, creating this cocoon for families. Because one thing that I know, Al, and I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it, with our 260 families who are resource poor, mm -hmm. who are partnering with us in the zone, they might be on, they're all on this, this scale of dysfunction, right, and healthiness, they all are. Some are way over here, some are inching you know, this way and so on, but they all, uniformly have a desire for their children to do better than they've done. And they're just asking for a partner who's gonna stay the course and help them with those things like housing. That's why we have a robust housing action team. It's not gonna be easy. And it does matter when a kid moves around all the time. It absolutely does, and they don't know where they're gonna sleep, and, and if they're not eating. And it does matter if dad or mom has a job or if they're in the house or not, or if they're being read to in early childhood. And that's why when you start giving families the education about how, let me just say this, and I'm gonna be quiet. Um, when, when we tell our parents, you know, check it out, um, and we, we have something called Family Academy, and uh, parents with children zero to, to um, uh, uh, three attend, and uh, and and they come. They come for 12 weeks. They learn all about brain development, positive discipline, and so on. And when we say to them, you know what? The difference, many of our babies are not ready for kindergarten and then they do not go on to college. Many of them get right in the cradle to, to the to prison pipeline or the cradle to gr the grave pipeline right now. I mean, we just keep it real. Um, because they're not ready to start school. They start off behind. And did you know that um, simply by reading to your child, middle class uh, children have heard 30 million words by the time they're three. Low income children have heard like 10. And we just like break it down with families and say, you just got to talk to them more. Mm -hmm. And we even, um, families are allowing themselves to, to, uh, to, for the babies to wear little boxes. It's called this Lena method of counting the number of words that are being spoken in a home. Because wow. we can look at um, across income lines around what kids do better based on how many affirmative words, by the way, <laughs> right? That they, there's a difference, that they've heard. And when you start telling them that, I mean, Al, they're like, they're in it. You uh, used that pathway to your political uh, path to becoming elected to the state legislature. So I'm asking you to wear your community organizer hat right now, not the legislator hat, and talk about how then must we organize, use our talent, our skill, to mobilize uh, moms and dads, mobilize families, mobilize children, and ultimately mobilize business and institutional stakeholders, because all of us have to win, yep. and there's Absolutely. no such thing as uh, a failure that's going to be okay or acceptable. It is not how, okay. How do we do that? And first, let me just say I agree with all that I'm hearing, and that I ended my conversation saying that poverty is not an indicator for failure. Right. Kids in poverty can be successful. They can be successful, and there's many things that we need to do. We need those community partners. You know. Schools need community partners. We as a community have to become more engaged and involved in the outcomes of our kids. But we also have to find a way to really engage parents. Because as a parent, you can only give out what you know and what you have to give. And sometimes it's a generation of you know, not graduating from high school or not, not, not. And so a big part of we cannot do our work with kids without doing that work with parents or the family, or whatever that family dynamic is. And so we have to, we have to get out, we have to organize, we have to become a, a community that is informed, involved, and saying that we're not going to accept anything less than success.
because that is achievable. It is. And there's many things we do. You know, homeless, homelessness, homelessness plays a part in that. Mm -hmm. Being transit plays a part in that. You know, going to school hungry, abused, neglected. All that plays a part in it. But you have a network of support. And it takes, you know, patience. You know, sometimes our educational school system are, are overwhelmed. They don't have the resources, they don't have the funding for the social workers, the nurses, and all that we need to have included to create better outcomes. That I'm sure, you know, we could look at Harvest Prep, you know, as what works, because it's working there. So how can we replicate that? We need to replicate what is successful. It's not like it's not there. There's models there to, that can clearly tell us how to create better outcomes for our black kids, in our black families, mm -hmm. in our black communities, wherever you are. We can do that, but it takes time, it takes resources, it takes patience, it takes understanding, you know, and it takes a network of support. And so we have to organize around that. And you do that from door to door. What I heard um, Sandra talk about is knocking on doors. You have to knock on doors and engage people in the conversation. We can't be the solution for others. People have to be a part of that solution and that path. So you knock doors, you ask the question, you engage them, you do small groups, you know, you do educational learning tools. We have to equip our community, our parents, with what they need to create those better outcomes. Let me bring Jeff in here. Jeff, you've got to leave in about five minutes, I think. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to, you to <clears throat> make reference to the recent awards uh, earned by <clears throat> Harvest Prep, significant national recognition. Uh, what's going on with them? Yeah, just this past weekend, uh, got back from Chicago where um, Harvest actually was Best Academy because the organization is called the Council of Schools uh, Educating Boys of Color, okay? COSBAC is the, uh, is the acronym. And uh, <clears throat> Best Academy uh, uh, and, and their all boys program, by, by the way, has all boys and an all girls program, but the all boys program was identified and received a national award for the education of African American boys, the 80% proficiency in math but, uh, and, and reading. But the, the other thing is that there were five other schools from around the country uh, that received similar awards. There's a Thurgood Marshall Academy in Washington, D.C., and it's in the area called Anacostia. Now, uh, Washington, D.C. is probably 60-ish percent African-American, but Anacostia is like 100 percent, right? Anacostia is like the north side of uh, Washington, D.C. Thurgood Marshall Academy, 100 percent graduation from high school, 100 percent college placement, okay? And, and demonstrating once again, no excuses, this can be done. This is readily achievable. Uh, Maryville, Indiana, which is about 35, 40 miles from Chicago, received two awards for, for both their elementary school and their high school, 90%, uh, either 50% African American, 40% Hispanic, okay, population, uh, achieving beyond state standards. There's one school, and sorry I can't call their name, they're called a 90-90-90 school, uh, and, and there's a study done recently, 90% low income, this poverty that we like to talk about as, a, as an excuse, 90% uh, low income, 90% minority, and 90% proficiency. Huh. Hmm? Huh. What am I talking about? Huh? 90, 90, 90, okay? And there's schools around the country that, that are doing this, and as as uh, Sandra identified and what Eric laid out in his five gaps analysis, the most significant gap is this belief gap on the part of students, parents, teachers, and school leaders. And, <clears throat> you know, I've had so many interactions with public schools and, and uh, um, the, the school leaders and teachers. So, so, so the question is, is mm -hmm. the belief gap <clears throat> mm -hmm. simply an accidental thing? <clears throat> did it just happen? Did, did it just happen? <laughs> Is it we, we just woke up and you know we just kind of didn't feel like we had so, the so ability? Did we accidentally or, come or, from Africa? or is somebody? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> or is there somebody's interest uh, on the table being negotiated without their participation 
uh, is somebody's interest being furthered? And is there a war that is being waged, that the, or that we have to wage, to uh, establish a direction that allows us to do uh, the 100%, 100% uh, mm -hmm. that we believe we are and can be? Right. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there is the, uh, a war of the minds going on. But, you know, there used to be this saying when I uh, was growing up that, uh, and, and pardon my language, that the white man used to stay up at night figuring out how he could hold the, uh, the black man back. Now he goes to bed early because we're holding our own selves back, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Uh, and that's what the African American Leadership Forum is about, and that is nobody's gonna do this except us. And we have some of the most outstanding leaders who are part of our organization, including Sandra and other people who are, I mean, we have PhDs in neurophysiology, MBAs in, in business. We have leaders at uh, General Mills, Medtronics, you, you name it, uh, congressmen. If we can't solve this problem, we can't blame it on anyone else except ourselves. You know I mean, that is fantastic, mm -hmm. but until we hit it at the ground level, Absolutely. As we do some grassroots engagement, enforcement, some organizing, it has to come from the community. We have to engage the community in a bigger and better way. They can do it. We have to instill within them that they have all the power, the resources inside to create better outcomes. They absolutely have it, and we must engage them. You know, I can clearly say the state, the state has failed our children, right? <laughs> they have not done a good job. It is about no excuses. Right. No excuses. I mean, because we can give plenty of excuses mm -hmm. why our kids are failing, why there's such a huge disparity. But I say, I'm with you. No excuses. We need to do what all we need to do to ensure that every child is graduating out of high school. They choose to go to college. Fantastic. Let's push for that. Let that, let that be the goal, you know. But there should be absolutely be no excuse. And we have to invest in that. And investment is not always about funding. Right. It is about a, definitely a mindset of every teacher, every administrator, every state official believing that a child can succeed, whether they are in poverty, whether they're living in St. Paul, Minneapolis, North Minneapolis, or in Dina. It can happen if we get put in just the personal resource, resources, the belief that kids can be successful. But that it's a part of my job too, is to go back to my community and say, I need you to show up. We are powerful people mm -hmm. doing powerful things, but it just doesn't stay in our community. We have to show up at that Capitol. We have to fight for what we believe. We have to make a stand in what we believe. No one is gonna do this for us. We should not expect anyone else to do this for us. We have to take a stand and show up, be at the table, with those who have the power to create the change and be a voice for what we need for our community. Nobody can bring solutions to our community but us. We have the answers. So that's part of my goal, is to have us as community people to show up. It's not a party thing, but we know the political process is about those who are in power. So show up and still be engaged. You know, bring those parents that you're working with to the Capitol so they can know that process. There is a process that is about them that they need to know about. Community is connected to a political process. The mm -hmm. two go hand in hand. We can't do one without, to do the, uh, without doing the other. I don't want us to do one without doing the other. We need to combine them, build our power, so that we can create the change. That's what the whole civil rights movement was about. It wasn't about elected officials or the politicians or those who was rich. It was about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It comes from the community at a ground level. So Let's Jeff, engage them. I think you're saying that there, there is this cadre mm -hmm. of uh, super talent that's mm -hmm. prepared and wants to engage. Right. And Sandra, are you able to engage uh, those parents who are North Minneapolis parents who are part of the leadership forum? And is there a role for people that aren't in North Minneapolis to support and engage in ways to advance the work of uh, Northside Achievement Zone? I, I do, yeah, so so I, you know, I, I tell you, yeah, I, gotta leave. thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Safe Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right. You know, I, I got to tell you, there's 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 often been. Yes, there, there is a um, when it comes to what's happening with African-American children in, in this country um, who are um, uh, imperiled at every single, you know, aspect of their lives, particularly our boys and our low our, our resource poor boys, I think 
that, that what needs to happen. And this is what I'm seeing happen. And, and I'm seeing people from all walks of life, race, uh, income, in North Minneapolis, outside of North Minneapolis, really moving forward, Al, because they know that the city and the state can't be well unless North Minneapolis is healthy. I'm seeing that do that, seeing them do that. And um, we have a, a group of folks who are supporting all of this wraparound that we're doing with families and, and how we're working with schools, you know, and, and, and the schools that are doing, you know, really working hard to change this thing. And our wonderful school leader, Bernadia Johnson, we have a group of um, uh, uh, folks called Friends of the Future, Mm -hmm. and they are you know like a hundred strong and they contribute even with our grant they know that we want to sustain this beyond the grant mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 right now I think the name of the game and I think um, representative Moran would agree for me is educating our community you got to do some education first um, you, you have to have a relationship uh, in order to have full engagement uh, in the issues that are impacting the most. And so that's what we're doing right now is starting, like Jeff was saying, we told parents, you know, ask if your child is at grade level. The school leaders told me here in North Minneapolis that most of the kids are two to three to four grade levels behind. And many of our parents don't know that. That's why... I understand what you mean. That's why, so when we did a survey of the zone with a Wilder Research partner with our community folks who make our, up our NAS connectors, um, of a 400 randomized sam uh, survey, um, overwhelmingly, over 90% 90 uh, 90 of the family said, yep, that they, you know, really love their local school. The United Negro College Fund did the same thing and found the same results across the country. Quantum leap here and throw some things that are kind of unrelated but related for both of you. Uh, I appreciated the recent article on you, the interview with you in the Star Tribune, and you made comments about North Minneapolis, a place where there are 2,000, I think, uh, preschool children, but where some kind of policy is allowing the um, uh, placement of a high number of sex offenders and you challenge the wisdom of policy that connects vulnerable children uh, in a um, environment or the places predators right. in an environment with vulnerable children. Right. That's one thing to talk about. And how does that whole policy continuum uh, show linkages or lack of linkages, things that don't make sense or do make sense that hurt our children and our families? The second question, Representative Moran, has to do with uh, something we'll discuss later today with uh, Kevin, um, uh, Commissioner Kevin uh, Lindsay, uh, when he comes. And he's going to talk about the fact that uh, the re rate of retirement in the country is like 10,000 people leaving workforce every day. Right. In Minnesota, the state. Uh, replaces around 3,000 people every year. Mm -hmm. How do we get our people into the jobs? Mm -hmm. And those jobs are jobs that influence and affect policy mm -hmm. uh, at the state level. Mm -hmm. And how do our ability, how does our ability to get meaningful and powerful positions impact educational outcomes and decisions like the ones that you say is a negative one that puts offenders in around children in our neighborhood. So big questions, uh, start with, you've got about a minute and a half to talk oh, about gosh. it, so okay. just so, a, a feeling. Um, so we look over the next 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, we have the baby boomers gonna be retiring, mm -hmm. you know, so it's an opportunity and the diversity of our state is definitely gonna be changing. So I agree that, you know, I'm not well unless we all well, we don't do well unless we all do well, but we had to begin this now, creating those opportunities. Um, we're, we're not planning for tomorrow, we're planning for 10, 20 years out where we have the kindergartens who's gonna be graduating soon. But also preparing those who are now for a workforce. And you know, we have to create those opportunities. You know, Kevin has a, um, a goal of 32% people of color working on any construction jobs. You know, some people, they, they mumbled and grumbled about that, like it's impossible to happen. Like, you know, where are we gonna find people of color? You know, they're there, we're not hiring them. Right. We're not searching them. You know, so we have to be a part of the tool to point out where we can find or help so them. It's a crisis of will, in part. And it's the always achievement is. gap is really a gap in will. You said that, I believe. Yeah. So it what do we is. do? How do we mobilize and firm up the will of our people so that we can have the successes we need and we deserve, and that we have to bequeath to the generations that follow? Well, you know, you know, people um, people feel valuable when they're valued. 
And, uh, and I think that that's what we're starting to see. I am very hopeful, by the way. Uh, I think that that's what we're starting to see is that um, the, my neighbors. And the value has to start with. Us. With us. There we go. <laughs> you know, it has to start with us. You know, so, so many of my parents aren't showing up at the school board meetings right now. But you know what? Kim Nelson from General Mills, Jeff Hassan, Sylvia Bartlett from, from Medtronic, Eric Mahmoud, you know, me, Shonda Smith-Baker, Bill English, we're showing up. We, we are black folks in force mm -hmm. standing in the gap because we value our kids. While our families are being educated, while we're mobilizing, we're not standing still. And because and, and fundamentally, Al, when you know, Jeff said it, he said that Eric went around and looked at the schools that were doing it around the country, who had resource poor kids, who, ha who had black skin, you know, no daddy, you know, struggling, moving around, popo, right? And still were educating them at incredible levels. And, and he's replicated what he saw, great teachers in the classroom. So we, we have to have teacher evaluations. How do you know if they're great? Right now what's happening at the Capitol with the Senate, okay, is that they're saying they're gonna postpone teacher evaluations for yet another year. We passed it. That's the, that's the game we do in politics. You can get something passed. Doesn't mean it's gonna be executed. Having a great teacher is fundamental. And then having teachers based on those evaluations stay in the classrooms. We're out of time. Okay. Sa Sa Sandra <laughs> Samuels, thank you so very much. Sandra Samuels is the CEO of Northside Achievement Zone. State Representative Rena Moran represents District 65A in St. Paul. Uh, and I think rightfully boasts that this is an education legislature uh, for the state of Minnesota. Our thanks to Jeff Hassan, an education consultant and attorney who worked uh, on behalf of the school district and on behalf of the uh, African American Leadership Forum. Thank you all for listening. I'm Al McFarland. Join us again next week. Thank Al McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a roll. Let's conversation. Cause this thing is safe. The message is clear. Everybody knows we gotta keep it not clear. We just going to talk about the Al McFarland show.